Um, but open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. We have been going through storms in the scripture and looking at these different storms um, and how to, we can thrive. As we go through these different storms, we've looked at a number of them. I thought, I don't know if you were here on Wednesday night, it was pretty kind of funny is how the Lord just worked it out. But I've talked about Peter walking on water for two Sundays, and the missionary comes in, and guess what passage of scripture he goes to? Yeah. Peter walking on the water. And um, he approached it completely different than I had the last two weeks, so you know the Lord's working. I told Brother Charlie, though, it was just for him. Because he was on vacation when I covered it. So it had to be, you know, Lord's like, he needed, to, he needed that message on walking on the water, I guess. <laughs> so, but we're going to look at it. The storm's a little bit different today as we're going to look at a couple of different storms. And I want to talk about this broken in the storm. Broken in the storm. We all know those people who a storm comes into their life. And instead of running to Christ, they run away from Christ. Or sometimes maybe we've been through a storm in our own life and we go through that storm and because we're not seeking Christ, we end up broken in a storm. There are those who maybe a storm has come into their life that, that we've looked up to, we've seen in the past, and they end up falling into sin as a result of that storm. So if we're going to thrive in the storm, if we're going to thrive in the storms that comes, whether it's because the Lord's testing us or whether it's because the Lord's chastening us, there are some keys for us that we can thrive, but that we can keep from being broken in a storm. So we're going to look at those this morning and look at how we can not be broken. So look at Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse number 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken unto him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for what you want to do in our life. Lord, for the Word of God and how it helps us that we can run to it. And Lord, we can learn from it and apply it to our life. And Lord, how we can seek your face in the Word of God. And I pray that you would use me this morning as I preach. Fill me with your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we have a story, a familiar story. If you remember, maybe even as a kid, you sang the song, right? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Remember, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Foolish man built his house upon the sand. Foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. In both of those parts, the rain comes down. In the wise man's life and in the foolish man's life. But the difference between the two men was what they built their house upon. What they built on. For you and I as a Christian... Our foundation of our life, our cornerstone, the inner circle of our life should be Christ. He should be at the focus of everything that we do in our Christian life. If we are going to have a life that thrives in the storms of life, we have to be founded and circled and in, around Christ in our life. One of the key reasons why people are broken in a storm is because they're not founded on Christ. They're not founded on him. They're not built on him. This story talks about the wise man building his house upon the rock. If you go through scripture and you look at all different portions of scripture, you can see how Christ is the rock. If you'll remember in the Old Testament, they, people were crying out for, for water. They were thirsty. 
And the Lord told Moses to go and smite the rock. Out of the rock came water. The Bible even says the rock followed them in the Old Testament. I don't know how that fully happened. But I know that Christ needs to be the rock in your life. There's all kinds of things that people will center their life around today in, the, in their life. So I know people that have center out, centered their life around their children. That was their core part of their life. The challenge they then faced was when children left home. They, they ended up leaving. And they, they, their world was so shaken because their life was centered around their children. You can center your life around your spouse. And your spouse should be a very important part of your life. That's that person that God gives you, that, that help meet, that you walk together in life around. But if you center your life around your spouse, there can come things in your life, whether it's losing a spouse to divorce or, or to death, that your world will be totally shaken by. You can center your life around your job and find all that satisfaction in your job and what you do and, and who you are and how you much you just enjoy your work and all those kind of things, and then you retire. We know those people, you ever retire and you see that person, they just slowly fade away because they centered their life around their job and when they didn't have that job, it was like they just didn't know what to do. You can center your life around money. You know someone maybe that has focused, that's the whole focus of their life, get money, get money, get money, and they can never have enough of it. And they're just constantly trying to get it. And when they die, it's all gone. You take none of it with you. But when you center your life around the Lord Jesus Christ and you put him as the center, the center of your marriage, the center of your family, the center of what you do for him. And the Bible says whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. When you center your life around Christ and he is that center, when the storm comes and the waves begin to beat upon you and you face an a issue in a relationship or you face an issue in your job or you face an issue in your home or, or in your finances, because your rock is Christ and your life is built on him, it's going to be difficult, but you'll make it through the storm. The foolish man did not build his house upon Christ. He built his house on the sand. If you build your house or your center your life around anything but Christ, when the storm comes, it's like building your house on the sand. You see some of these homes that the hurricane come through, right? And just wipes it down. Why? Because the winds are going to come. There will come a time that rain's going to come. We got a little bit of rain this morning. I was thankful for that. A right, little bit, spring, didn't, didn't rain very long, but the rain's going to come at a point. Storms will come to your life. And if you are not built on Christ and centered on Christ, your world will be shaken. And you watched it even during COVID time. People all of a sudden didn't know what to do. Churches shut down, people were at home, crime goes up, depression goes up. Suicide goes up. Why? Because something that helps them be, keep fastened to the rock, the local New Testament church, was not there. And people's world began to begin shaken because they weren't as focused on Christ as they needed to be. And you saw it in how many people just dropped completely out of church. Instead of running back. If one of the key reasons people end up broken in the storm of life is they are not built on Christ. Number two, being with the wrong crowd. Being with the wrong crowd. In 2 Chronicles, look at this story here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there was a good king named Jehoshaphat. 
That's a long name. Could you imagine having to spell that in school? Jehoshaphat. Just spelling that would be a challenge. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we see this story. It says, And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah, in verse 31, I'm sorry, verse 31. He was 30 and 5 years old. He was a good king. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. He brought about revival in the, in the land. His mother's name was Azabah, the daughter of Shelah. Shilhai, whatever, and he walked in the ways of Asa's father and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So a good king, doing what's right, had been raised godly, is living godly. Uh, verse 33, Howbeit the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. Notice, it's the difference between a leader's heart being prepared and the people's heart being prepared to serve God. Your heart needs to be prepared just as much as my heart needs to be prepared. You know sometimes why people struggle sometimes to get things out of church is because they stayed up super late Saturday night and they fill their mind with all kinds of junky television programs and all this kind of stuff. And then they get up Sunday morning and they're just dazed. Or people that stay out drinking, what you name it, and then they try to come to church, and then they're, fall, they're having trouble. Whether it's, I'm not talking about health reasons, but I'm just saying whether it's falling asleep because they stayed up till midnight. I remember talking to kids years ago. Oh, I stayed up till 2 in the morning playing video games. And then they wonder why they're falling asleep in Sunday school, right? But, but your heart and my heart all needs to be prepared to fa to, to, for God to do a work. And this, their hearts was not prepared but we see that it says here, now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, verse 34, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Jeru, the son of Hananiah, who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. It says this, look at this. And after this, did Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, the king of Israel, who did very wickedly. Oh, wait a minute. So now we have a good king, joining himself with a wicked king. And what they're going to do is they're going to go on this business venture together. If you want to learn about business ventures, you should read the book of Proverbs. Proverbs has a lot of wisdom about choosing partners, whether you should be a surety or go into co-signing, all those kind of things in the book of Proverbs. But this godly king joins himself with an ungodly king. And they, it says, in this, this man who did very wickedly, in verse 36, and he joined himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ship in Ezan Geber. Then Eliezer, the son of Dohava of Marshara, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works. And the ships were broken that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Look at this. Here's this king, godly king, joined himself to an ungodly king. And God said, guess what? You join yourself with this ungodly king. I am destroying these works. See, you don't, if we were to take a glass of water this morning and we just put one drop of poison in it, and it was completely full of water until we put that one drop of poison in it. Nobody would want to drink it, even though the majority of it was water. But when you mix poison, no, 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 that's poisonous. I can't take that. When we mix truth with error, it all is error. When you mix a lie in with the truth, it all becomes falsehood. And when we, as a Christian, join ourselves to someone who's a wicked person, we place ourselves, the Bible talks about even an unequal yoke in the New Testament. And we align ourselves with those person. And here's the thing, if God's going to judge a wicked person, do I want to be under judgment because I'm with the wicked person? So that person is driving down the road, and that person is, is doing wickedly, and God says, yep, it's that person's time. That person's time. The day of grace for that person is up. Would I want to be in the car with that person when their day of grace is up? Probably not, right? But sometimes 
in our life, we tend to think, well, that's a good person. Or, or they may, you know what, sure, they're not doing like they should, but this is just a business venture, or this is just a friendship, or this is just, we're just going out to eat together. We need to be careful that we don't join ourselves and align ourselves with someone that is a very ungodly person and doing wicked. And this person, that this, this other king that Jehoshaphat joined himself up with, God said, I'm destroying your ships because you aligned yourself with them. You know, to me, and I, that, that's why even with my kids, I'm careful about who I want them to be around for friends. Why? I don't want them with the wrong crowd that's going to pull them in the wrong way. That's why I have to watch out for that Sam guy. I mean, he's a suspicious character, right? And that Todd guy, you really know he know. I'm teasing. But you know what? Like, I need to be careful who they're around because if they're around a wicked person and God says, I'm going to correct that, deal with this wickedness, I don't want to be aligned. And if you and I are not careful... We can be broken in a storm because we align ourselves with the wrong people of the world. Now, we are to be in the world, but we're not to be of the world. I'm, as a Christian, I'm to be the light of the world. I'm to be the salt. I'm not to just mix, in, mix all in with the world and be like, oh, nobody can see a difference. One of the reasons why I'm convinced we're not seeing sometimes a revival in our country is because the world looks at most Christians and says, what's the difference in that person? Why would I want that? They're no different than me. They look the same as me. They talk the same as me. They do the same things as me. They go through trials like I go through and they they're just as, have just as much a hard time as I do. And for you and I, there should be a difference. We're an ambassador for Christ in our life. We are to be that light, and we need to make sure we don't align ourselves. And one of the things we see is that this king aligned himself, and God destroyed that. Number three, living in disobedience. We can be broken in a storm because we live in disobedience. We know this story, but in Jonah, right? Jonah chapter 1, we find the Lord comes to Jonah in Jonah chapter 1. Verse number one, it says, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amnitai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Preach to Nineveh. Now we all know there was plenty of good reasons for Jonah to say, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Those people are evil. They have slaughtered the people of God. Those people are idol worshipers. They're, they're, they're worshiping idols. They're not going to worship God. Go to Nineveh. God, that's a long ways from here. I have to go on a long journey, get on a boat, and do all this stuff to get to Nineveh. I've got I to go travel to get to Nineveh. That's a long ways away. There would have been lots of reasons why Jonah could have said, God, you know what? I'm the wrong person. I'm a Jew. They are the, they, those people, they're not going to listen to me. They see me as someone to be conquered. There could have been good reasons in Jonah's mind to say I shouldn't go to Nineveh. But God told him specifically to go to Nineveh, to go there and cry against it because their wickedness was come up. And the Bible says, but Jonah arose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah said, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going in the opposite direction. I have no desire to go to Nineveh. Matter of fact, I'm going to go the other way. And he even thinks that I can go away from the presence of God. I can hide out and God will forget about me. God won't know. You know, it'll be okay. I'll go down in the ship. And God let someone else go. But God began to pursue Jonah. See, if you're the child of God, and you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior, you're his child. He will pursue you. It's kind of like a little kid, right? Remember those times as a little kid, mom tells you to do something? Maybe it was to stay out of the cookie jar, right? And somehow mom has eyes in the back of her head. 
mom knows that you got in the cookie jar. It might be because you smiled and had chocolate chips on your teeth, right? It might be because she heard the little jar clanking and opening up, right? But there's a way of be sure your sin will find you out. When I was probably, oh, maybe third grade, my brother and I were playing outside and we were bored. And we thought, you know what? We got to come up with something fun to do. We thought, you know, let's do, let's go ring people's doorbells and run away. Now, I'm sure none of you ever did that as a child, right? Never do that kind of stuff. But uh, we thought, we're going to go ring people's doorbell, and we're going to run away. And so we know we're fast. Nobody's going to be able to find, see us before we get done with this, right? And so we were going, and we start pushing this doorbell, and had this lady that come out and look at it and, and all this kind of stuff. And then we thought, oh, we need to do that again, right? So you go up and ring the doorbell and run away. Well, then she starts walking down the sidewalk, to try to figure out who's doing that, right? And wouldn't you know it, my dad comes out, out of the house about the same time. And he goes over, and of course, he's going to ask the lady, well, what, what, you know, what you looking for? Because he's that kind of person anyway. He's going to find out what's happening out here. And she tells him, you know, someone's ringing her doorbell, and guess what? I was found out, right? Be sure your sin will find you out. And my dad was not very pleased that I was ringing doorbells and running away. And I could have thought that, you know, no one's going to see, no one's going to know. It'll be a secret. And I'll get by with this. But God has a way of exposing sin, especially for his children. The Bible says what's done in secret will be shouted from the housetops. And God's going to send a storm in your life if you're a Christian. If you're in disobedience, his desire is for you to get right with him. He wants you to come running back to him. And he's willing to send a storm of chastisement into your life. And if he needs to, prepare even a great big old whale to swallow you up, right? Just so you'll get right with him. And Jonah was running from God, running from the presence of God. And he ends up no longer in the boat, but in the water. Then, not just in the water, but in the whale's belly. Now, I have, I'm not a big fan of certain animals. I do not think I would want to be in a whale's belly for three days, for sure. Right? You can imagine. Now, the good thing is you can, eat, you can not eat for a couple days and you can um, survive. But you can't go without water for very long, right? You have to. Our body has to have water. Imagine what it'd be like in that whale's belly. But God knew that that's what it was going to take for Jonah to turn back to God. And you know what? God knows what it's going to take for you in your life for you to turn back to him. He knows exactly what circumstance he has to bring you in. And what point he's going to have to take you to. And we all know those people that it's like, God's working on them, God's working on them, God's working on them. But they just won't listen. Right? They're not listening to his voice. They're not trying to hear his voice. They're trying to go to Tarshish. Away from the presence of the Lord. And in our Christian life, if we don't choose to follow him, they, we can be broken in the storm because... We're living in disobedience. I think of this. Wrong living cost David his son with Bathsheba. Wrong living has a cost to it. There's a price for it as a Christian. For the wages of sin is death. There's a price for sin. You will reap what you sow. And in his life, it cost David his son. It cost Saul his throne, right? He was chosen to be the king of Israel, head and shoulders above everybody else. Boy, they were excited when Saul became the king of Israel. But Saul did not obey. He was told to go completely wipe out the Amalekites, and he didn't listen. He thought, oh, no big deal. I'm going to kill everybody, but I'm keeping the king, I'm keeping the sheep, and I'm keeping the oxen. After all, I can sacrifice those to God. We're going to offer God a sacrifice. 
right? Yeah, it's funny, you know, kids like to try this when they're little too, right? Hey, you need to go clean your room. Or no, it's usually, here's this, go, it's time for bed. This is the big one, right? It's time for bed. Oh, but I need a drink. It's like they're dehydrated all of a sudden, right? I'm, a, I'm dehydrated, I need a drink. Put them in bed. Oh, but now I'm having bad dreams. I, they haven't closed their eyes yet and they're still having bad dreams, right? I'm having bad dreams. Oh, no, I'm cold. Oh, no, my tummy's hurting, right? They will do everything they can to delay what they're supposed to be doing. My parents used to always say, delayed obedience is disobedience. It is. If I delay, it's not obedience. It's me choosing to disobey. And you know, in our Christian life, sometimes as adults, we know what we're supposed to do. We know what God's doing in our life. But even if I delay, delayed obedience is disobedience. And God will allow that storm to come to correct me, to choose to do right. Next, number four. God's stripping from you the things that keep you from him. God will put you in a storm, and if you're not careful in that storm, you can be broken because God says, you know what? I'm going to strip from you all the things that are keeping you from depending on me. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Here's the thing for you and I. We are in the Christian race. Paul compares it to being a soldier. He compares it with being a workman. He compares it with being a runner in the Christian race. Now, you know what? If you've ever watched the Olympics and you've watched those people or watched someone run, they do all kinds of things to get prepared for that moment that they run. Boy, they're going to work out. They're going to practice their endurance. They're going to prepare their body with the right kind of diet that they need. But wouldn't it be foolish for them to do all that and then to get to that moment of the race? And they say, you know what? I might get thirsty on this race. I better carry a backpack full of some water bottles, right? Just in case I get along. And you know what? Man, this race, this is a long distance race. I'm probably going to get hungry on this race too. I think what I need to do is take a couple packs of Little Debbie's, the Swiss cake rolls. I like those. Those Swiss cake rolls, those are good. And um, I also like, although most of my family doesn't like, the banana um, the marshmallow things, the banana, I think banana, not cream pies, but moon pies, banana moon pies. Ah, oh, I like those too. And, um, but imagine, you know, well, I, need, I like these and I'm going to get hungry on this race, so I'm going to put these into my backpack, right? We look and say, what is that guy doing out there? There's no way he's going to win this race going out with all that extra weight on him. But wait a minute. Water bottles aren't a bad thing. Water's not a bad thing. Those Swiss cake rolls, now, depending on how many you eat at one time, that might be bad for you. If you're a diabetic, probably shouldn't have a whole bunch of those, right? But they're not necessarily a bad thing. But it's not for that moment. And the Lord in your life wants you to just depend on him. He wants you to rely on just him. And if we try to bring along a lot of extra baggage in our life, he'll send us into some storms that strip those other things from us. Remember a couple weeks ago, we looked at the storm that Paul went through. First, they had to throw out the tackling of the ship. Then they, or first, they threw out the merchandise of the ship. Then they threw out the tackling of the ship. It got so bad that they even abandoned the ship at the end, because the ship got completely broken. But the Bible says they all made it safe to land. And in your life, if you are depending on your job for security, jobs can be come and go. If you're depending on your spouse for all your security, God can take your spouse. God wants us to be dependent on him. And those other things that we have in life, God will allow those things in our life, 
but I need to make sure that I'm not dependent on those, that that's not my focus, that my focus is on the things of God and what he's doing in my life. If you and I are going to, stri- are going to thrive in the storms of life and we're not going to be broken, we've got to examine our foundation, examine what our life is built on, We have to look at our life and we have to say, am I focusing my life on Christ and what he wants to accomplish? I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't care if you're three years old, 80 years old, 90 years old. Until you're laying in front and you're not breathing anymore, God has a plan for you. He has something he wants you to accomplish. It may be being a witness to your grandchildren. It may be being a testimony to those others that are looking at you. And you may say, well, I can't do that much. I can't get out and about much, or I can't do these things like I used to do. But God still has a plan. It might just be that you are the one that's to hold up your family in prayer. But God has something for you to accomplish. And if you choose to say, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to focus on that, I'm just, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy my life or I'm going to focus my life on other things, you're going to miss out on the blessing of being in the center of God's will and what he wants you to accomplish in your life. If you're going to thrive in the storm of your life and not be broken, you're going to have to build your life on Christ. It's got to be centered on him in everything that you do. You're going to need to stay away from the wicked. Stay away from the wrong crowd. Don't allow, don't join yourself up with them when they're living in a wicked way. You're going to have to live in obedience to Christ. God, what do you want me to do? I'm willing to be obedient. I'm willing to follow you. I want you to do that. And then you're going to have to make sure that you're not carrying a bunch of extra baggage that you're not carrying all these things in your life that are hindering your relationship from God. I remember years ago in church, there was a couple that came to church and they struggled to be able to have a child. I remember us praying and praying for a couple years that God would allow them to have a child. I remember even my dad, uh, he, he would, if there was a circumstance like that sometimes, he would anoint the, them with oil. I remember we prayed for him, anointed them with oil, and God allowed them to have a baby, little baby boy. They had that little boy, and they ended up outside of church. Not in church anymore. And you know, you look sometimes at those things and that very thing that they had wanted ended up being the thing that took them away from the things of God. And in your life, if you get so focused on something else other than Christ, the devil has a way of putting those lures out there that may not even be bad things but that he's just going to pull you one step at a time away from the things of God. And we got to be careful. Those things are good. God wants us to enjoy life and enjoy the blessings of all the things that he's given us. But they shouldn't be our core focus. It shouldn't be that core thing that I'm, that I'm centered on. Is your life centered around the Lord Jesus Christ? When it's centered around him, you can thrive in the storms of life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. Lord, I pray that we would base our life around you and we would see you be the center of everything that we do. In Jesus' name, with heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. Maybe you're here this morning.